Welcome back, brothers and sisters, to the viewing of DVD number five in our series, Decision Time Two. We're going to pick right up where we left off at our this four. I want to read a verse of scripture with to you right now. I hope you open, you have your Bibles, and I'd like you to open them to Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. That's what we were dealing with last time. We had compared 2 Chronicles 36 and Ezekiel 8 and 9. So we want to open up our Bibles now to Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. We are going to pick right up where we left off. Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, verses 16, and then we're going to have a word of prayer. Ezekiel 8, verses 16, and I'm going to read it. I hope that you will read along with me in your King James Bible. And the Bible says, verse 16, And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Brothers and sisters, no remedy. Let us pray, Father in heaven, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, we come before thy righteous and holy throne. As we enter into this next DVD, the information that we will share, we pray for the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to be with us, to enlighten our hearts and our minds that we might comprehend, be empowered to make a decision to follow the every step of the way. Thank you, dear Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Good to be back, brothers and sisters, to sh continue sharing this information with you. I believe, thanks, that we are in a very critical time. We'll continue now with the information that we started in, the, in this four. We are now in this five. No remedy. And I again want to say that it is decision time, thanks. It is decision time. If I ever believe that it was decision time, I believe that it is decision time. And in, in the last this week, in the last um, setting, we talked about a little of the things that you and I need to be making decisions on. Now, we're going to get deeper into this as we try to bring this information, give you all of this information during this, this next viewing. We have still three more, uh, two more just in this series to go. We believe that we have reached a point in time where we are approaching the time of no remedy. I want to take you back now. Before we continue, I want to take you back to something that we talked about in uh, the first disc, the Alpha of Apostasy. As Ellen G. White laid out what the battle was about, and I'm going to put this on the screen at this point in time. Let's look at what the prophet said. I want to make sure we're on the same page. Look what the prophet says. She says, the battle is on. The battle is on. Satan and his angels are working with all the deceitfulness of unrighteousness. They are untying in their efforts to draw souls away from the truth. Away from righteousness to spread ruin throughout the universe. They work with marvelous industry to furnish a multitude of deceptions to take souls captive. Their efforts are unceasing. The enemy is ever seeking to lead souls into infidelity and skepticism. He would do away with God and with Christ, who was made flesh and dwelt among us, to teach us that in obedience to God's will, we may be victorious over sin. Saints, did you get that? The battle is on. What is the battle on over? It is on over whether we can have victory over sin or not. This is what the whole controversy is about, saints. The whole controversy is over whether we can have victory over sin or whether we will continue in, to, in sin until Jesus comes. That's the lie that Satan has put upon us. Now, the Alpha of Apostle we have already discovered was an attempt by Satan working through the medium of pantheism to undermine the pillars of our faith. And that pillar, the sanctuary, is the one that gives us, shows us how we can have victory over sin. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Continuing on. It says, 
The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they cannot overcome. Christ, she says, Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. And his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Saints, did you hear that? Let me read this again. Let's make sure that we understand. This is what this is all about, brothers and sisters. The Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life. He took upon himself the infirmities of humanity, but still lived a sinless life. That men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, and we are all weak humanly, because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. In spite of our weaknesses, brothers and sisters, you and I can overcome by the power of the indwelling Christ. Continue. Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature. That's what Peter says. And his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Brothers and sisters, this whole controversy, this whole battle, this whole uh, uh, war is about whether or not we can keep the law of God, saints. And God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church to be the depositors of his law. He raises up. He gave us the, the three angels' message, brothers and sisters, so that we could be a light upon a hill. The whole Christian world, as we've already discovered, do not believe that we can overcome sin. They believe that we will be sinning until Jesus comes. They believe in original sin, etc., etc. But God raises up as a special people to prove that the lie of Satan is just that it is a lie. Continue. Look at our screen. We see the, the, the four posts. We had 1844. We have the National Son of Law. We have the COP, which is the close of probation. And we have the FC, which is the second coming. Now, we're going to deal with this chart in, in quite a bit as we, as we go through this, this, this particular DVD. Look what the prophet says, saints. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot of stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Now we talked about that in our last disc. The prerequisite here is is that once our characters are cleansed of every defilement, then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Going back to our chart that we talked about so much in the last disc, we want to just bring you up to speed. Just, I know we, we, I said I wouldn't do a lot of reviewing, but I just want to put this on the screen one more time. We have discovered that in verses 16 of Second Chronicles, that the children of Israel came to a point, the tribe of Judah came to a point that there was no remedy. As a matter of fact, let's go there and read it. Let's go back to Second Chronicles and let's read this again. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 36. Just a little bit of review, just a little bit of a review. Second Chronicles 36, looking at verses 16. The Bible says. But they mock the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. And in our last DVD, we went on to discover what could these people possibly do that God would make a statement to the fact that there is no, no remedy. There's nothing else I can do. We want to expand on that as we continue in this particular DVD. What is it that they could do? And we talked about that before. Let's, let's go to another uh, slide from our last presentation. Taken from Testimonies, Volume 3, page 266 to 267. She says, 
The true people of God who have the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealings with sin, which easily beset the people of God. Especially, she says, especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. I want to key in on this point. Especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God. Continuing on. This is forcefully set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. This is Ezekiel chapter, chapter 9. She says this is forcefully set forth there in Ezekiel chapter 9. She says, she goes on, one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's ink on by his side. That's the sealing angel, saints. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. She goes on to tell us there, saints, that only those who are signing and crying for the abomination that's done in the church will eventually be sealed. Only those, brothers and sisters, that see this thing and understand this thing. This is critical for you and I as a people to understand what's taking place. I mean, let me read something to you from, from Testimonies, Volume 5. And, and, uh, and I told you to read this before, and I hope you have had time to read this. I'm going to read it to you just in case. Testimonies, Volume 5, and we're on page 210. She says, in the time when this wrath shall go forth in judgments, these among the devoted followers of Christ will be distinguished from the rest of the world by their soul anguish, which is expressed in lamentations and weeping, reproofs and warnings, while others try to throw a cloak over the existing evil and excuse the great wickedness everywhere prevalent, those who have a zeal for God's honor and a love for souls will not hold their peace to obtain favor of any. Thy righteous souls are vexed day by day with the unholy works and conversation of the unrighteous. Next statement, saints. Listen to this. They are powerless to stop the rushing torrent of iniquity, and hence they are filled with grief and alarm. They mourn before God to see religion despised in the very homes of those who have had great light. They lament and afflict their souls because pride, avarice, selfishness, and deception of almost every kind are in the church. Key point here, is, saints, they are powerless to stop the rushing torrent of iniquity in the church. Saints, what is this saying to us? It is saying to us that this downward march to apostasy, this omega, cannot be stopped cooperatively. But brothers and sisters, you and I individually can take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth, and we must do this if we intend to be a part of this, this team that God is going to use to finish this work. Are you hearing me, saints? These are serious times. Father, again, we ask for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit as we try to share these precious truths with our people. May we all be affected, Lord. May we all see the necessity, Lord, of taking a bold and unyielding stand May we all, as Jude said, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Please, Lord, grant us the presence and power of your Holy Spirit as we go through this information. Thank you, Lord, for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, saints, we're going to now begin to build on where we left off. This is just a little review. We have seen now that Second Chronicles, the 36th chapter, and Ezekiel 8 and 9 are parallel. One deals with the physical act that was taking place at the time that, uh, that the Jews were about to go into Babylonian captivity. And Ezekiel 8 and 9 actually is pointing forward in time. The prophet says that, that, that Ezekiel 8 and 9 is a symbol of the closing work on the Seventh-day Adventist church. And now we have gone, in, in our last DVD, we went over to Revelation 18 chapter to show 
that this, this, this fourth angel, which is a, is a loud cry message, which is a swelling of the, third, of the third angel, calls for God's people to come out of Babylon. And so God has to have a people from within the confines of the Adventist church, or with, or with the confines of this message that he will use to finish this work to call the other people out of Babylonia, out of, out of this deception that Satan has set up. Now, I'm going to, we're going to look at a statement that the prophet makes in relationship to this, this swelling of this third angel. Let's look at it. The third angel's message. Look what she says, brothers and sisters. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry. And you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty. Now, saints, I want us to understand something here. The prophet says that the third angel's message, the one that warns against receiving a mark of the beast, she says the third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry. In other words, brothers and sisters, we are moving into Revelation 18, chapter verses 1 through 4. She says it's swelling into this loud cry. People are getting themselves together. They're seeing this thing, and, and as they do this, God begins to bless them with more of his Holy Spirit. Look at this. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry, and you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty. And still entertain the idea that at some future time, you will be the recipients of great blessings. When, without any effort on your part, a whole wonderful revival will take place. Brothers and sisters, we cannot wait any longer. We must decide today that we're going to do what God says. Let's continue. Today, you are to give yourself to God, that he may make of you vessels unto honor and meat for his service. Today, you are to give yourself to God that you may be emptied of self, emptied of envy, jealousy, evil, surmising, strife, everything that shall be dishonoring to God. Today, you are to have your vessel purified that it may be ready for the heavenly dew, ready for the showers of the latter rain. We must prepare ourselves to receive this latter rain. And brothers and sisters, it's coming. She says, for the latter rain will come. And the blessings of God will fill every soul that is purified from every defilement. Saints, I cannot overstress the fact that we must purify ourselves by the power of the indwelling Christ. Now, in our next DVD, we're going to talk about some of the things that you and I must do in order to be filled with this power. Because we want to look at the key to having this victory. Brothers and sisters. This is serious, and we are definitely at the end. Let's continue. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ, that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is taken from First Selected Message, page 190. Saints, let's look at this. We're studying the Word of God here now. It is our work today to yield our souls to Christ that we may be fitted for the time of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, fitted for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're wondering when we're going to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, when we are cleaned up so that we can receive a lot of rain, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the antitype of the early rain. The latter rain is the excuse me of the is the antitype of the of the early rain. Saints, we must get ready, and we can no longer wait for a system to get ready. We are, you know, we, we, we spend so much of our time concerned about what's taking place cooperatively, brothers and sisters. It's time for us to get ourselves together individually. It's not time to fight co the corporate structure. This not go it can't be fixed. Ellen G. White says. This omega apostasy cannot be fixed. She says nothing will be allowed to stand in this way. We just read here that you will see the Russian torrent of iniquity in the church and be powerless to do anything about it. You can't fix the corporate structure. Satan has gotten control of the system. And this is hard. This is hard thing to say. Because to say this, it, it seems like you're anti, the, anti church, anti whatever. But this is just simply prophecy, saints. It cannot be fixed. We have gone too far. We are now about to make the final step corporately. And a lot of people 
are going to make the step with the cooperation and, and found act in this apostasy. Let's continue. Look what the prophet says. One thing is certain. Those seven day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner. Do you know what Satan's banner is? Satan's banner is the son of law. We will see this in just a little bit. So look what the prophet says now. See, when we, when we take our stand completely under Satan's banner, brother, says we, that's it. But see, there's a prerequisite to getting there. See, let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to Ezekiel, the eighth chapter. Let's look, let's look at Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, verses 16 again. Let's look at this thing, brother. So, so let's study this thing up. We are studying the word of God. In verse 16, it says, now remember, in Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, remember Ezekiel was called into the prophetic office in 592, and uh, God uh, allowed uh, Nebuchadnezzar to come back and destroy the city in 586. So God was actually letting Ezekiel see what was, take, what was still going on down in Jerusalem prior to him allowing uh, Nebuchadnezzar to come back for this final time. And again, the prophet says this is an end time prophecy. So we see a litany of apostasy, a litany of things that the ch church was doing at that time, starting with ch uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And we get down to the last one. Now, verse 16 in Ezekiel 8, 16 actually ties in with 2 Chronicles 36, 16. Let's, let's go back to 2 Chronicles. I want to make sure we get this, brothers and sisters. Please forgive me for, for laboring the point. But I want to make sure we get this. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 36. Let's look at read 16 again. I want to make sure you get this. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 16. But they mock the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. In other words, they mocked the messengers of God, despised the prophets' words, the messengers' words, misused the prophets until finally God says, Okay. Until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Now, this is Second Chronicles 36, 16. Let's go over to Ezekiel 8, 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. Brothers and sisters, the thing in, in 2 Chronicles 36, 16 that brought God to a point to where there was no remedy is what they did in, in, in Ezekiel 8, 16. But Ezekiel 8, 16 is a last day application of what took place in 36, 16. So the last day application is they, the turning of one's back on the temple or on the sanctuary or on the sanctuary of truth and then facing the east and worshiping the sun. In other words, brothers and sisters, now, this was an instantaneous act back then. To you and I, saints, it was a time, that's a time element. First of all, we turn our back on the sanctuary of truth. Once you turn your back on the sanctuary of truth, now you are prepared to keep Sunday. Once you turn your back on the, on the fact that you can overcome sin, you are now prepared to keep Sunday. Now, watch this. Because in order to turn your back, on the sanctuary message, you also have to turn your back on the messenger of Ellen G. White. Look at this now. Let's go back to the screen. One thing is certain. Those Southern Day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner. Satan's banner is when you turn your back on the temple and face the east and worship the sun. Keep sending it. All right. One thing is certain. Those Southern Day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimony of God's Spirit. Did you get that saying? In other words, be before, before you keep sounding, before you take your stand on the Satan's banner, you're going to give up your faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies 
of God's spirit. That's the spirit of prophecy as well as the word, the, the word of God is found in the Bible. Let's continue. The call for consecration and holy of service is being made and will continue to be made. Point. I want us to understand here that the prophet says the prerequisite to taking your stand on the Satan's banner is to first give your, up, the, up your belief in the warning and reproofs contained in the testimony of God. In other words, what, the, what God has given us through the spirit of prophecy, through the testimonies, through all of the books, all the 25 million words that she's written, what God has given us through that, we begin to make light of it. We begin to reject it. Because, see, the prophet makes it very plain that we must have victory over sin. Now, saints, most of you probably viewing this DVD already believe that we can have victory over sin, but we're just not so sure as about when it's going to take place. That's what we want to deal with. Let's continue here. Now, since Ellen G. White makes it very plain that we must have victory over sin, that, that, that's the whole plan of salvation. The Bible makes it plain. But the three in this message, that's what, it, that's what it's about. The, the, the reason God raised up this church, that's, that's what he raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church for. But since Ellen G. White makes it so plain, then Satan's game plan is he must get rid of Ellen G. White. Now, remember in Revelation 12, 17, the Bible says that Satan went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who, who did he go to make war with? He went to make war with the remnant of the seed, which keep the commandments of God. In other words, they keep the law of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy. So, Satan says that I must get rid of of the spirit of prophecy. I must get rid of the prophet. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Let's read it. Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious, the false, to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none affect the testimony of the spirit of God. Satan, we should not read this in a calm state. I mean, this should excited. I mean, this should alarm us. That's what it should do. It should alarm us. To read this should alarm us because the prophet is saying the very last deception of Satan will be to make a none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. In other words, brothers and sisters, to make a none effect does not mean that we won't still have the books. We won't be still selling the books. You just won't believe the books. You just won't, you won't accept the book. You, you won't accept the message. You will take the message and try to turn it and make, make it say something else. You simply will not. You will mock the messengers of God. You will despise the prophets until the wrath of God arises and there is no remedy. So in turning your back on the, the, the sanctuary of truth of victory over sin, you automatically turn your back on the prophet. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Where there is no vision of people perish, Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsell the confidence of God's remedy people in the true testimony. There will be a hatred killing against the testimonies which is satanic. Did you get that? The workings of Satan will be to unsell the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions. If the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded, brothers and sisters, if we would simply heed the warnings and counsels that God has given us through the Spirit of prophecy, Satan would not have a chance to deceive us because everything he'd do would be like a, a first grader trying to do a, a magic show. Because we can see right through it. But because we do not believe the prophet, because we have not believed the prophet for, for years, because we have, that we have denied the prophet for years, the things we, this didn't just happen. Brothers and sisters, this has been going on for a long while. We are just seeing the end results of what has been going on for years. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? It is time for you and I to take a bold and unyielding stand 
for this precious truth that God gave us in the first generation of seven day events. Continue on. The blotting out of sin. Let's go to Acts 3.19 right quick. Acts chapter 3 verses 19. And then we go on to a chart on the wall. Acts chapter 3 verses 19. Let's read what, what Brother Peter says. And we're coming back over here a little, a little later on. But we want to go to Acts chapter 3 verses 19. This is what is happening on the day of Pentecost. A very important statement. Now, I want to start with verses 18. I hope you have your Bibles. Let's open them up to Acts chapter 3 verses. Let's start with verse 18 and 19. Peter has been preaching. All right, verse 18 says, But those things, excuse me, which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Verse 19. Now look at this. Verses 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Let's analyze. Peter is saying, first of all, we should repent. Then he's saying we, and then be converted. Which is a prerequisite for the blotting out of your sins. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now, so Peter has now put a time element on when our sins will be blotted out. So here the Bible says there's a time which our sin is going to be blotted out. Key, when will these sins be blotted out? That's the key. When will these sins be blotted out? And that's what we need to understand in this, in this presentation. And we need to understand not only will we have victory over sins, but these sins are going to be blotted out. What do you, Saints, if you're familiar with computers, you know that you can delete an item on your computer. You can actually wipe it off the hard drive. I mean, it can be wiped off the hard drive where it cannot be retrieved. And that's what God's going to do. This hard drive here, God is going to blot out the sins. Well, you can't even, you can't even call them back. So that's what we need. We need our sins blotted out, not covered. Now, during the year of service of the sanctuary, let's, let's, go, let's go up here. During the year, year of service of the sanctuary, out here, the sins were just covered, covered, covered. But finally, they were blotted out over here in the most holy place experience. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Over here, they're covered. They come in here, and they're put on the, on the veil and just covered, covered. But brothers and sisters, that's kapar. But in, on the day of atonement, the sins was actually blotted out because on that day, the priest went into the most holy place experience and made the atonement, or an at woman, and the sins was actually blotted out. When he came out of here, brothers and sisters, when he came out of here and went back into the outer court, he cast those sins upon the head of the scapegoat. That was the judgment. That's the day of atonement, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, saints? So Peter saying, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. We need to know when is the time of refreshing. Let's go back to our screen. The work of the investigator's judgment and the blotting out of sins is to be accomplished before the second advent of the Lord. Key. So now we see that this blotting out of sins will take place before the second advent. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. Since the dead are to be judged out of the things written in the books, it is impossible, the prophet says, that the sins of men should be blotted out until after the judgment at which their cases are to be investigated. Let me read that again. Make sure we get it. It is impossible that the sins of men should be blotted out until after the judgment at which their cases are to be investigated. In other words, saints, 
it's impossible to blot out of our sins before we are judged. Are you with me? So we must be judged before our sins are blotted out. Are you with me? All right. Continue. Now, the prophet quotes Acts 3.19. Now, what she quotes, she, 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 she referenced Acts 3.19. Now, what she says. But the apostle Peter distinctly states that the sins of believers will be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ. Look what she says now. When the investigative judgment closes, Christ will come and his reward is with him to give to every man as his work shall be. So, we know that in Revelation, the Bible says, Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work should be. So we, at this point in time, saints, the sins have been blotted out. But well, we want to find out exactly when will these sins be blotted out. Now, I'm going to the, a book. I'm going to read to you from the book, or the writings. I'm having, saints, I'm, having a, I'm just having a good time here as we study the word of God. I'm having a very good time. I love digging into the word of God because saints this, this stuff is so rich this is so good we ought to be excited we ought to be shouting Jesus is coming soon to come and you know I hate to say this but brothers and sisters the greatest evidence of where we are prophetically is the increased attack upon our church as we see the various things taking place in our church today I just read a letter that someone sent me from an email from David Asterix that he wrote to the General Conference President concerning the fact that at Alaska Air uh, uh, University that they are now teaching as a fact evolution. They are teaching it as a fact. And he wrote to, to the General Conference President and said, you, you, look, you must do something. Of course, well, I'm, I'm not, not going to elaborate on it. You probably, most of you probably already read the, the email yourself. I'm reading now from early writings, page 71. Dealing with what we just read here. She says, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. Other well, writings, page 71 says, There is a preparation in order for us to receive this refreshing. Are you with me, saints? Let's continue. So we cannot wait and think that the refreshing will, will prepare us. No, we must be prepared before the refreshing. We must have this upper realm experience now if we intend to be a part of this group. Now, I have, we have the, the, the chart now on the, on the screen, the sanctuary chart. One year of the sanctuary service represents the whole plan of salvation. Look at this thing. Now, out here in the outer court, we have Eden Lost. It's the same as here. This is the outer court out here. This is on the screen. The outer court. Now, so here's Eden Lost. This is Eden Lost. Out in the outer court. That's where the sin first took place. But over in the most holy place, which is right here, brothers and sisters, that's where Eden is regained. In other words, the the plan, the sanctuary service gives us the whole plan of salvation. Sin enters in the outer court, but brothers and sisters, over in, 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 in the most holy place, Eden is regained. Because we come back to a sinless state on the day of atonement. Are, we, are you with me, saints? Now look at this. Out in the outer court, we are redeemed. But we, we must do more than just be redeemed. The education, page 125, talks about the, the, the central theme in the Bible, the theme from which every other in the book clusters is the redemption plan, the restoration of the image of God in man, victory over sin. So we are redeemed in the outer court, 
restored in the holy place and victory in the most holy place. So it is the process of sanctification from the outer court to the holy place to the most holy place, brothers and sisters. Are you with me, saints? This is a sanctuary. And so when we turn our back on the sanctuary of truth, brothers and sisters, we are now prepared to keep saying, as a matter of fact, saints, all through the history of this church, all the different men that have arisen, powerful men in this church, Ken Wright and others, that turn their back on the sanctuary of truth, ended up keeping Sunday. And saints, it is it's going to be the same now. The prophet says, in many, many places, I'm just quoting one. This is Testimonies, Volume 1, page 608. She makes the startling statement. Matter of fact, she called it startling. She says, I was shown the startling fact that but a small portion of those who have professed faith in this third angel's message would go on to be sanctified by it. She says they will get above the simplicity of the work and be lost. Great controversy, page 608. She says, as the storm approaches, a large class gave up this message and became our most bitter enemies. She says, many of those that we have admired for their pleasing address will be in a course to testify against us. Another place, she says, the church will appear is about to fall, but she says it will not, it will, it will remain while the sinners in Zion are shaken out. We never read the statement of above that. The reason she says the church is, is, will, will appear is about to fall because she saw so many give, it, give up the truth. And in another place, she, she talks about a blast coming through the church and not one saint, not anyone was left standing. That blast, this reason she says the church will, about to, will appear is about to fall is because of the attrition of people who will give this message up when the crisis comes and we are approaching that crisis at, break, at, at lightning speed. Continue, brothers and sisters. Now, let's look at our chart. Let's look at our chart now. We, Ellen J. White says, has God a living church? She says, this is in Testimonies of Man. She says, he has a living church. She says, but it is the church militant and not the church triumphant. Militant means that there's war going on. There's a fight going on in here. There's wheat and tares in God's church. And to select a message now, oh yes, select a message book two, page 114, bottom of page 113, top of page 114, she says, a new power is coming from above and taking possession of all God's people. Two parties will be developed, the wheat and the tares grow up together until the harvest. Now this is serious, brothers and sisters. There are two opposing influences continually exerted on the members of the church. One influence is working for the purification of the church and the other for the corrupting of the people of God. The tares are working for the pu pu for corruption and the, and the wheat are working for the purification. The wheat are trying to tell the people you got to have victory over sin. The, the, the tares say, no, we'll be, you don't have to, you, we can sing, swing, and celebrate. The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of an era of false principles. When is the harvest? Because the, the, in, in Matthew it says, let them both grow together to harvest. And the problem here is that we have believed that the harvest is the end of the world as in when, second, when Jesus comes the second time. We think that that's the harvest. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what L.G. White is saying. We want to find out when is the harvest because, saints, that's the issue. That's the issue. When is the harvest? Look what the prophet says. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. Not the second coming. The harvest is the end of probationary time. In other words, the harvest is the time when God says there is no remedy. There is nothing else I can do for these people. Their probation is over. It's closed. When will that time be? When we turn our back on the temple and face the east and worship the sun or keep Sunday. In other words, brothers and sisters, when we turn our back on this precious truth that God has given us and because we do not have a vital connection with him, when the crisis comes in the form of a national Sunday law, and we give up this faith and keep Sunday, there 
He has no remedy for us. But see, saints, we can look around us now and know who that's going to be. And I don't mean to be a judge here. Just a fruit inspector. What I mean by that, what, 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 Brother Mason, what are you saying? This is what I'm saying, saints. I'm saying, if we do not believe that we can have victory over sin, you've already turned your back on the sanctuary. Now you're prepared to keep Sunday. If you do not believe, if you are watering down the spirit of prophecy, if you, she said, one thing is certain, those seven dead Venus who take their stand on the Satan's banner will first give up their belief in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimony of God's spirit. So when we see people professing to be seven dead Venus, but do not believe in the spirit of prophecy, then not the spirit of prophecy, that's a prerequisite to giving up this faith and keeping Sunday. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So, brothers and sisters, as we look around us and see the apostasy, the step-by-step -step apostasy that Ezekiel showed us in, in Ezekiel 8 all the way through 9, we see the very thing taking place before our very eyes. And the prophet tells us in, in, in 3T, 266 and 267, that this is a, a, a sign of the last work. This is the figure. This is it. We're here. Oh, yes, this should alarm us. This is real. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of probationary time. So, brothers and sisters, on, we, we see here we have, from 1844 to the National Center Law, we have the wheat and tares in God's church. But God says, I have to separate the wheat from the tares. Ellen G. White says, this is a terrible ordeal. Nevertheless, it must take place. In Testimonies, Volume 5, page 707, the prophet says, God says that if all other means fail, he will allow heresy to come into the church to separate the wheat from the tares. And that's exactly what's taking place. So, once the Son of Law takes place, brothers and sisters, the wheat and the tares will be separated because the tares are going to give up and keep signing because they have been yielding step by step. They've already said, we can't have victory. We don't believe in the spirit of prophecy. We, it's not a fact. We don't, we don't read it. We don't accept it. We don't obey it. So, you're prepared to keep Sunday. The prophet says in Great Controversy 533, I believe it's 533 or 338. I can't remember. 338, I believe. Those who are yielding step by step to worldly demands will find it an easy thing to yield to the power of the being. As we yield now, we've been yielding so long until when it comes to this last thing, we'll yield on that as well and justify it. So, saints, on our left, we have the wheat and the tares. That's the church milton. But on our right, we have a church that's triumphant. Brothers and sisters, that's the church that we want to be a part of. That's not a corporate structure that's found on the earth. That's the church above. That's the church that God will use to finish the work. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? So, brothers and sisters, the NSL brings us down to the beginning of the harvest time. We want to go to early writings. And we want to look at the early writings, page 118. Early writings, page 118. Get out your early writings. Pause this DVD. Get your early writings out. Don't let me just read to you. Let's read it together. Early writings, 118. See, it's time to understand this information. I then saw the third angel. Which angel was it? The third angel. Said my accompanying angel. Fearful is his work. The work of the third angel is fearful. Awful is his mission. The mission of the third angel is awful. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares. Did you get that? He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares. It's not a literal angel. It is the message. Evangelism 234 and 235. Go ahead and read that. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat from the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. So it is a third angel that selects the, se selects the wheat from the tares in the church. It is that message warning against yielding to that son law. Now let's continue. Separation of wheat from the tares. 
and the blotting out of sin. If you notice there on the top, I have the NSL. In other words, saints, we are now dealing with the time period between the National Assembly Law and the COP, which is the close of probation. And you see I have there between those the blotting out of sin. Look what the prophet says. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. For it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the found tests shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. How can anyone argue with that? That's so plain. People, people call me and write me all the time, but I, I just can't see this. It's right here in this book. Statement after statement after statement, the spirit of prophecy in the Bible, showing that the close of probation for Seventh-day Adventists takes place as a result of our decision at the passing of the National Sun Law. And the thing with is, saints, we are making our decisions right now. The Sun Law is just going to make manifest what we're doing right now. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state contrary to the fourth commandment will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Is that plain? Brothers and sisters, it's, 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 while, look, let me read it again. While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state contrary to the fourth commandment will be in a vial of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. And the sad thing about all of these things is that the prophet tells us that the majority of professed Seventh-day Adventists are going to give up this truth and keep Sunday. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Is that plain, saints? Is that plain? How can we not see this? So, when, when the prophet says, soon, none know how soon the judgment will pass from the dead to the living, the prophet's not saying, we, she, she, she's saying, what she's saying is, we don't know the date that the judgment is going to pass from the dead to the living. But the event is the passing of the national son of law. The event, when, when the son of law passes, brothers and sisters, judgment passes from the dead to the living because at that time, the living has to make a decision. Actually, brothers and sisters, they've, they've been making a decision all along. It just becomes manifest at that time. Who will be the first to be judged? Seventh day Adventists will be the first to be judged because they are the ones that understand the issues when the Son of the Law is passed. Do you get it? Because we will be the first one to be judged. God has to separate the wheat from the tares in this church as a result. That's the thing he's going to use. That's the thing. That's the, what's, what it will be. The Sabbath is a great test, saints. Let's continue. And it's not being preached to us. It's not, we're not being told this. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of probationary time again. So, brothers and sisters, from the national sun of law to the close of probation is harvest time. Harvest time begins with the church. The seven have been judgment begins at the house of God, and that's what we read over in Ezekiel. Remember over in Ezekiel? It's, 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 look, let's, go to, oh, let's go to Ezekiel again. Ezekiel. Let's go to Ezekiel again. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. Let's go there real quick. Get your Bibles. Don't let me read to you. Get your Bibles. All right? You remember, we, I'm not going to get into all the details because we did that in, in, in this number four. This, we, in this, here we see that the angels have come. The, the six angels have come. Six men, with the, with, with, and one among them have the right ankle on by his side. And verse 3 says, And the glory of the God of Israel is gone up from the cherub. We talked about this last time. Verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Ellen G. White makes this plain that this city, or this Jerusalem, is the church. And set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst of the Verse 5. 
And to the others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite, let not, let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is a mark, and begin where? And begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men, which were before the house. And brothers and sisters, we found out who the ancient men were before. Let's just find out who they are again. Let's go over to Isaiah. Isaiah. I'm sorry. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, saints. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Who are the ancient men? Look what it says, brothers and sisters. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 15. Let's start, well, actually, let's start a little bit before. Let's, let's start with verses 13. For the people turn not unto him that smited them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. Now God makes it very plain. Verse 16. For the leaders of this people cause them to ear, and they that are led of them are the scribes. The Bible tells us, begin. And then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Begin with the leaders who have led this people astray. I hate to say it, but this is just what it says. Brothers and sisters, that's what it says. Lord, help us, please. We cannot, look, we're not joyous about this, but brothers and sisters, this is a fact. And so, saints, we must bring our lives in the harmony of God. Let's continue. Well, that's what we see here. The Lord has shown me clearly, clearly, she says, that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. Now, I'm, 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 I'm rushing a little bit now. So in order to know what the image of the beast, go to Great Controversy 445. For it is to be the test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. She says the image will be the test by which our eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. It's plain. That's so plain. How can we argue with that? What's the question mark there? All who prove their loyalty to God by observing his law and refusing to accept a spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner of the Lord God Jehovah and will receive the seal of the living God. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. That's plain, saints. In other words, the Sunday Sabbath issue will determine whether we receive the mark of the beast or whether we receive the seal of God. If we will stay loyal to God, we receive the seal. If we don't, we receive the mark. But the key thing is, it happens at the Sunday law. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Let's continue. So, from the National Sunday Law out to the close of probation, the mark of the beast will be being given to those. First, first if you yield up, first it's going to happen to Adventists and then to the rest of the world. As we give the loud cry and people hear this truth, they have to, they have to make the same choice that we had to make. Are you with me, saying? So, the mark of the beast. The sealing, because once a person decides, I'm going to do what God says to do, they receive the seal. That's the, so the sealing will take place all the way. It starts with Adventist first and moves on to the rest of the, the other sheep that are not his fold. Same statement. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot of stain upon them. It is left of us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. It's plain. The latter rain. That's Revelation 18, 1 through 4. In order to brothers and sisters to be a part of that group of Revelation 18, 1 through 4, you uh, must have received the seal of God. In order to receive the seal of God, brothers and sisters, you must have just every spot and stain off of your character in order to be received the latter rain so that you can give what's next. I, I also saw that many do not realize. I, we already read it. I'm going to move on because my time is... I just read it to you from early writing, page 71. But I'm going to move on. So the latter rain empowers us to give the loud cry. The loud cry is what brings in the other sheep that are not as full. Look what the prophet says. The other sheep come in 
as a result of the loud cry. That's the one. And then, brothers and sisters, according to Mary, not from page 199, there will be martyrs. People are going to lose their lives between the national Sunday law and the close of probation. People are going to take a stand for the truth, and they're going to lose their lives. And the fact that they lose their lives will cause others to also take notice and, 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 and investigate this information and also take their stand for God as well. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Victory over sin. Look what she says. When the third angel's message closes... Mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. You see, I have here, this, this, this takes its own fault. See, the COP is a close of probation. The SC is the second coming. So now we have moved from the NSL to the COP. We're now between the COP and the second coming. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the earth. The people of God have accomplished their work. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. They have accomplished their work. They have received the latter rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying hour before them. Brothers and sisters, it's decision time. What decision do we need to be making? We need to be making a decision now. I'm going to do whatever God says. I want to be a part of this team that's going to finish the work. And if we're not a part of that team, saints, we're not going to be saved. God has raised us up as a people. And I, and I have to be honest with you, in order to be a part of that team, you're going to have to step out of the norm. You cannot wait on the church to do this cooperatively. The church cooperatively is not going to do it. I have to say that the church cooperatively is in the Omega Apostle. They're going to keep sending me. Are you hearing me, saints? This is hard stuff, but it's true. They have received the light of rain, the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and they are prepared for the trying out before them. Angels are hastening to and fro in heaven. An angel returning from the earth announces that his work is done. The found test has been brought upon the world, and all who have proved themselves loyal to the divine precepts have received the seal of the living God. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary. Do you see this? Brothers and sisters, then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. In other words, it is only after the it is only after Everybody has been sealed that Jesus ceases his intercession in the heaven. So that means Jesus has not, have not yet stood up yet. Look what it says. Then Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice says, it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes the solemn announcement. No remedy. Nothing else I can do for him. The whole world now has rejected Christ. The whole world have turned from his law. Except that little company. I want to be a part of that little company. What about you, brothers and sisters? Continue on. He announces, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case has been decided for life or death. Christ has made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The number of his subjects is made up. The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven is about to be given to the heirs of salvation. And Jesus is to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. These are solemn words. And saints, unless you and I decide today to be a part of this number, we will not make it. We must decide now. Will you and I be a part of this number? Brothers and sisters, we need to pray for one another. We need to all be having now an upper room experience. We don't want God to come to our names. And God says, there's no remedy. There's nothing else I can do for Brother Mason. I'm not going to ask him to do for this sister or that brother. We don't want that. And so we need to make a decision right now. You're viewing this DVD. You need to make that decision. You need to stop and pause and have prayer. God, help me to make, be a part of this team. Help me. When he leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. That means, brothers and sisters, if they must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor, they won't be, they won't be sinning. Brothers and sisters, their sins have been blotted out way back right after the passing of the National Center Law. When they made the, 
As a result of that decision to stay faithful to God, as a result of the passing of son-in-law, their sins were blotted out. That was, and they received the refreshing from the presence of God. They received a lot of rain that empowered them to give the loud cry so that the other sheep could hear this truth. Their sins have been blotted out. They can't recall any sins. Jesus has now left the most, the, 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 the most holy place. Jesus said, I can trust them. They're not going to sin. So he leaves and prepares to come here. And Satan has full sway to attack them of everything he has. And even Satan himself, I won't have, don't have time to get into that, but even Satan himself says they have become an impregnable force. Can't do nothing with them. Without an ancestor, the restraint which has been upon the wicked is removed, and Satan has entire control of the found impenitent. impenitent. God's long suffering has ended. No remedy. The world has rejected his mercy. No remedy. Despised his love. No remedy. And trampled upon his law. No remedy. The wicked has passed the boundary of their probation. No remedy. The spirit of God persistently resisted has been at last withdrawn. No remedy, brothers and sisters. Unsheltered by divine grace, they have no protection from the wicked one. Satan will then plunge the inhabitants of the earth into one great found trouble. As the angels of God cease to hold and check the fierce winds of human passion, all the elements of strife will be let loose. The whole world will be involved in run more trouble than that which came upon Jerusalem of old. Saints, the decision that you and I need to make right now. Lord, help me to be a part of this number. We need to stop playing. We need to stop worrying about what corporate Adventism is doing. Go and read Testimonies, Volume 4, page 210 to 11. Satan's chief work is at the headquarters of our faith. He spares no pains to corrupt men there in responsible position. He insinuates to get into their minds, to get them first to give up their, the, the warnings and reproofs in, this, in, in the testimony of God's spirit. Get them, get them to give up the spirit of prophecy. Then she says, next thing, he gets them to give up the pillars of our faith. And then number three, belief in the Bible itself. And then the downward march to perdition, which ends, which becomes incurable. The fact that we have made the NIV the official Bible tells me a, a lot. When we cannot even prove victory over sin through the NIV. We cannot even prove our doctrines through the NIV. Why would we use this Bible in the first place? I was looking at this, this, this week's Sabbath school lesson dealing with sin. And not one time did we say we could overcome sin. We, saints, it's no remedy. We must individually do this thing. Read Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80, 81, 82, and see who God's going to use to finish the work. It's time for us to take a bold stand for the truth. Stop waiting. It's time to do it today. No intercessor. As Satan influenced Esau to march against Jacob, so he will stir up the wicked to destroy God's people in a time of trouble. That's the only thing that's left for him to do. And as he accused Jacob, he will urge his accusations against the people of God. He numbers the world as his subjects, but the real company who keep the commandments of God are resisting his supremacy. If he could blot them from the earth, his triumph would be complete. I, I, look, I wish I had time to deal with that. But I know my time is getting away, and we must move on. The 144,000. I know that's a big debate on whether they're literally in, uh, 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 symbolic. We won't deal with that. But they will vindicate God's character because they will live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, and they will not sin. Victory over sin. That's the issue. And Satan... That wicked Satan has gotten in and he has brought in the, the new theology that we will be sinning until Jesus comes and that it does not matter. We are under grace. We are believing and teaching the same thing that Babylon is teaching. We are, look, we are joining in with Babylon in denouncing. And we've done it so subtly we don't even know it has happened. Brothers and sisters, let us take a bowl. Let us earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to you. Your mission today, as you go to church from week to week, your mission now is to try to reach some soul with this precious truth. Some sincere, ask God to show you some soul that you can reach. See, saints, 
This gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come. But now God has to wait until he can get a people that he can use now to do this work. We can no longer do this work cooperatively because what we're teaching, will not, that's not the gospel. That's no longer the gospel. See, the gospel is more than the state of the dead. The, the key component of the gospel is victory over sin, saints. And we're going to talk about some more things in our next, in our next, next this number, this number six. We're going to talk about some more things, but this message is, is, is broad. But saints, the key component, the central pillar, is the sanctuary, which teaches all of these things in a way. Now we're bringing this to a close. I want before I do that, I want us to go. Let's go back to Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, once God. Remember, let's, let's go to Ezekiel 9, verses 3. Ezekiel 9, verses 3. The Bible says, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub. And we talked last time, you know, we, we went into detail on that. We talked about how the, the God's presence was between the cherubs in the most holy place. And as this, this final abomination took place, as they turned their back on the sanctuary and began to face the east to worship the sun, it was only then that God says, Okay, it's no more. There's nothing else I can do for these people. So verse 3 says, And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the right ink on by his side. And he went in, now you know, you know what he did, he called for the man with the right ink on by his side, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon all those that sigh and cry for the abomination. Now, after this was done, the Shekinah glory actually left. Now let's see, where did he go? We're in Ezekiel 11th chapter. Now I'm happy to just, just briefly give you this. In Ezekiel 11, verses 22, the Bible says, Then did the cherubim lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above. Verse 23. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon a mountain which is on the east side of the city. Now, if we read all of this, verse chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, we will see a story developing. I'm just giving you the end of the story. After the stealing had taken place, God leaves. Now, when God leaves, I already told you, when God leaves a place, it becomes desolate. But remember now, those whom he had sealed, he was now in them. They weren't desolate, but the city itself was desolate. The other people that weren't seen were desolate. So God's presence now has been withdrawn. And so we see that when, he, when his presence was withdrawn, he went and stood upon the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. Now, saints, if we just do a little geography, the mountain that is on the east side of the city is the Mount of Olives. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now, let's go to Matthew. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, we see a similar experience. Same thing. Matthew the 23rd, verses 37, the Bible says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus is leaving. He said, I will work for you. I will do everything I could for you. But now your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of our Lord. Now look what happens. Verse, chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things, verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3. Where did, where did Jesus go when he announced your house is desolate? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him proudly saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of their coming and of the end of the world? When Jesus announced that your house is left unto you desolate, he went to the Mount of Olives, the same place that Shekinah glory went in Ezekiel 11 chapter. Because we know that Jesus is, 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 is the power that left, that was there. So brothers and sisters, here we see a parallel 
in this final analysis, brothers and sisters, Jesus will leave us individually. He left physical temples in, but now we're talking about spiritual temples. Because, see, brothers and sisters, from the very beginning, we were created for the dwelling place of God. The earthly sanctuary was just a mall. To, see, the Bible says, make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But the Spirit of Prophecy says from the very beginning, God, we were the dwelling place for God. So, but once we sinned, God could no longer dwell in us. So, brothers and sisters, he made a sanctuary that he could dwell among us till he could again dwell in us. Christ wants to dwell in us, but he cannot dwell in an unclean temple. We must clean up these temples. And we're going to talk about cleaning up these temples in the next day because that's key. That's very important. Pray for me as we pray for one another because Satan does not want this information to come out. We must get this information out, brothers and sisters. Now, we come into a close. You've seen this chart many times. The, the Jews had seven weeks to make an end of sin, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Seven weeks, 490 years. When Jesus came, they only had seven years left. God had chosen the, the, the Jews to, 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 to dispense the gospel to the entire world. They failed. And when he came, there was only seven years left. God chose Adventists to do the same thing. We have failed. And now God is trying now to get just a, a number out of here. That probation closed in 34 AD, saints. And our probation closes at the National Center of Law. These are parallel events. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? They are parallel. There's no guessing here. This is prophecy. If we don't get it right by the National Center of Law, we receive the mark of the beast. These are parallel. So, saints, we are operating between 31 and 34 A.D. Jesus says in 31 A.D., I'm leaving. Now, look what the prophet says. 31 A.D. to 34 A.D., God chose us. In other words, in 31 A.D., just before his, two days before his crucifixion, God says, your house is left unto you, to you desolate. What God was saying, Jesus saying here, I can no longer work through the leadership to reach my people. Now, probation didn't close until the 34, because they had 70 weeks, 490 years. But he could no longer work through the leadership after 31 AD. Look what she says. The leaders in the Jewish nation had signally failed of fulfilling God's purpose for his chosen people. Those whom the Lord had made the depositors of the truth had proved unfaithful to their trust, and God chose others to do his work. And I have to say it, saints, but the corporate structure of this church have proved unfaithful to their trust, and God can't use them now. They have proved unfaithful. We have gone a whoring after other gods. We've done everything contrary to what we're told to do in the spirit of prophecy. Everything that God told us to do, we have rejected it. Everything. We have cast away everything. And we have reached the same condition. Well, God says, I can't use you. I have people in there, but I can't reach them through the leadership. The, the things that the leadership has done, I can't. And there's great, good leaders in here, but we're talking about a system that has gone sour. It's just like the Catholic system. We often say, it is not the Catholic people, it is the Catholic system that's bad. And so, brothers and sisters, the same thing with us. It is, look, it is this, the Adventist system that has gone bad. It is the system that God can't work through anymore. God has people in here that he, he can use, but it, the system has gone sour. Look at this system, teaching evolution. Do, look at this system. It's dispensing drugs of every kind. Look at this system. Teaching accredited and all these things. And we could go on and on and on with the list of things that we're doing. Cutting babbling. God can't use this system. We're doing the very thing that God told us not to do. So God can't work through this system anymore. This system is bad just like the Catholic system is bad. There's good Catholic people in the church. As a matter of fact, Ellen G. White says the majority of God's people is in the Catholic church. And God is going to bring them. But the system, and so Satan has infiltrated our system and gotten control of the system, and he's using the system to control the people, and that's the reason, unless your attention can be gained and recognize this apostasy, brothers and sisters, you're in trouble. Those whom, <coughs> excuse me, those whom the Lord had made the depositors of truth had proved unfaithful to their trust, and God chose others to do his work. You, you, we've gone through this before, but I'm just adding this at the end of this thing so we can see it. In their blindness, these leaders now gave full sway to what they call righteous indignation against the ones who were setting aside their cherished doctrines. 
And brothers and sisters, you've heard me say before that we arrived at this point, I believe, around 1995. And we are now operating between 1995 and the National Center. I believe since 1995 when we put up that, that ecumenical logo and we're trying to defend it and make our like, you know, it's something special that we never had a three inches logo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, brothers and sisters. I believe from that point forward, we came to a point where God said, I can't work through the leadership of this church anymore. And see, I told you before, saints, it's just not a logo. It's the message that the logo represents. That's another story. You already, we've already talked about this. I don't need to go back there. So, God has now chose others to do the work that the system has failed to do. And we find out who they are in, in, in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80, 81, 82, and 83. Continuing on. They would not admit even a possibility that they themselves did not rightly understand the word. Same today. Or that they had misinterpreted or misapplied the scriptures. They acted like men who had lost their reason. What right have these teachers, they said, some of them mere fishermen, to present their ideas contrary to the doctrines that we have taught the people. Same today, saints. Being determined to suppress the teachings of these ideas, they imprisoned those who were processing them or teaching them. So we're in the same position today, saints. It's sad, but we're here. But it's prophecy. And we should not go. We should pray to all of our leaders. We should pray for our church and, and, and whole. And otherwise, saints, if we don't, then we're not exemplifying the love of Christ. Jesus says, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing when they crucify him. We must be the same way, saints. And it's going to take Christ in us because none of us have that love. Now, when Peter preached on the day of, <clears throat> on the day, on the day of Pentecost, this were the results. And you know, saints, the people that crucified Jesus was persuaded by leadership to crucify him. But the Bible says in Acts, the second chapter, that they were devout men because we know three times a year all the males had to come into Jerusalem. Are you with me, saying? We know it was, <clears throat> excuse me, at uh, 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 the Pente I mean, uh, Passover, which, it, at, which actually it was the Days of Unleavened Bread, but by the time Jesus came on the scene, that would became a three-day feast, but it was a uh, Passover, or the Day of Unleavened Bread. It was Pentecost, and in gathering three times a year. So the people that were in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified was persuaded by leadership. The multitude wasn't just local Jews. They were Jews from all over the world. So the whole church was persuaded by leadership to crucify Jesus. But 50 days later, those same people were back. And look what it says. Peter's preaching now under the power of the Holy Spirit. That tells you something, saints, because we must reach the people, but we can't do it in our own flesh. We must do it under the power of the Holy Spirit. That means all of us must have an upper room experience if we're going to do this work that God wants us to do. Look what it says. Now, they heard the disciples declaring that it was the Son of God whom had, who had been crucified. Priests and rulers trembled. Conviction and anguish seized the people. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You find this in, in um, Acts chapter 2, verses 36-37. Uh, 3, 36, 37. Let me go, let's go there. Let's go to Acts. Let me make sure. I want to give you the wrong information here. And we're coming, bringing this to a close. Acts. Acts chapter 3, I believe. Acts chapter 3. No, it's chapter 2. I'm sorry. It is chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 37. They were pricked in the heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? After they heard this, that 22 verses, Peter preached. Among those who listened to the disciples were devout Jews who were sincere in their belief. The power that accompanied the words of the speaker convinced them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. But the leadership says he's not the Messiah. Crucify him and ask for Barabbas. But now they were convinced that he was the Messiah and the Messiah has a message and the same, the same, the same prophecy that identified 